Today we want to talk about, in preparation for our arriving at Busan, a brief history of Korea and the Korean War. I will give you, um, I won't give you too much history, I'll only go back as far as 400,000 years ago, um, and give you some, some high points of the history, um, and some of this will relate to excursions you may be on tomorrow. For instance, um, if you go to the excursion that is the uh, Jiangju, it's the, I'm going to talk about the Shilla, or Silla, it's, it's spelled both ways, kingdom, um, and, and that's all about the history of that important period of time in the Korean uh, history, but we'll get into all that. So today it is all about Korea in preparation for our visit to Busan, and then I will do two talks on history of Japan, Emperors and Shoguns, a brief history of Japan, you'll get the whole overview. Then I will focus in on Samurai and the Code of Bushido. Then we'll have two a little more cultural uh, kinds of discussions about the Japanese gardens, Islands of Tranquility, Japanese art and architecture, and then toward the end of our cruise we'll come back to kind of the big picture, Japan versus China, in which I give you some of the details about the conflict between Japan and China over the centuries, uh, particularly in modern times since the mid-1800s, but um, the, what all of that, how all of that changed all of the history and culture really of, of East Asia. And the Russo-Japanese War comes into that in a little more detail too. And then finally, the broader uh, scope of the Pacific War. So we'll get to all these things as we go along. But today, let's talk about Korea. Um, the earliest evidence we have of human habitation in Korea does occur about 400,000 years ago. I wasn't kidding about that. But the first example we have of real civilization, usually civilization means cities. Uh, that's generally the definition when people have begun to have the ability to grow crops that allow them to settle in one place where they have domesticated animals. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, in 800 BC, we have evidence of pottery uh, in Korea, and that means they were probably more settled. Pots are pretty heavy to carry around if you're a nomadic people, so pots usually mean people were, were fairly settled, at least for part of the year. Um, and ceramics are always an indication of civilization everywhere in the world, because every culture has had ceramics. So pottery shards is one of the things that is often the first sign that they find of civilization, uh, the, the drawing together of people from a purely nomadic, wandering lifestyle to more of a settled. About 4000 BC, we have examples of Stone Age farmers in, uh, that is, particular planted crops growing. About 1500 BC, we have examples uh, archaeologically from socio-political uh, complexity. Usually that's because we begin to identify that there are more complicated uh, houses and simpler houses. Usually that means that there are leaders within communities that eventually become kings or there are priests if it is a more sophisticated um, kind of religious culture. You also begin to find various sorts of funereal rites, the burial rites, which is one of the signs of a developed socio, um, social pattern with uh, how people treat their dead. About 1000 BC, we have the Bronze Age evidence in Korea. About 300 BC, we have iron weapons, and we have evidence that various tribes had begun to join together into kingdoms. But the most important date for Korea, and the date that Koreans really look to a lot, is the one I have here. Um, in the year 2333 BC, not to be too specific, <laughs> the Koreans say that that is when Korea became its a kingdom. That is when Korea historically began because the belief is that is the founding of the state of Gojoseon. And in Korea they believe that the state of Gojoseon was founded by Dangun who was a who descended from heaven in order to establish the kingdom of, of Gojoseon, which is the uh, origin, the precursor of modern of Korea. We have no archaeological evidence of that, but this is very important to Korean identity. This idea that their culture is over 4,000 years old, um, and it has affected how they've responded to some things, including the end of the, of the Korean War, how they responded to things. Their reaction when the Soviet Union and the United States were going to divide up the country and sort of oversee things until they got settled, in South Korea especially, they were saying, we have been our own nation for over 4,000 years. We don't need you to tell us what to do. Um, and it's because they refer to this date as the founding of the predecessor to modern China.
We have examples in the 7th century BC uh, in the Zhou Dynasty in China of references to Korea having a culture. And then um, in 108 BC, the Han Dynasty, one of the most important dynasties in Chinese history, uh, came to Korea and they established four what they call commanderies. And those four commanderies ruled the Korean Peninsula for a period of time and then developed later on into three kingdoms. One of the most important developmental times um, of, the, of Korea were the Three Kingdoms period in which you had, in the north, you had um, Goguryeo, then Silla, or Shilla, it's sometimes spelled. You'll see that in our description of uh, some of the uh, excursions that we have tomorrow, and then uh, Baekje. These three competed with one another. Um, they were heavily influenced by China because China had planted these commanderies. They had sort of um, injected their own approach to civilization into the Korean Peninsula. These three fought for supremacy. Finally, Silla absorbed Baekje in 660 um, AD, and uh, Goryeo then was absorbed in uh, 668, leaving just the one, Silla or Shella. And the, one of the excursions tomorrow, the Goryeo, um, excursion will visit some of the historical sites and the archaeological evidence that we have for that particular civilization, which is what this image represents. This was a time when the, uh, the Silla period in Korea was the time when they really developed from a largely tribal society into a monarchy where they had one king, but it was a little different than some of the other monarchies in China and in Japan in that there was a council of tribal leaders. Later they were identified as nobles. It was called the Kwai Bay. The Kwai Bay would determine who it was that would become the next ruler when it was time to have a new ruler. Uh, so it wasn't hereditary. Um, it was entirely decided by the various tribal leaders, the later on nobles. It was a strict hierarchical society. Most of the people were serfs, but then there were, there were a clear strat a strategy, uh, sort of stratum of various hierarchy of nobles. They had developed a lot of this from the Chinese example, and from the Chinese example they created a Confucian university. Confucianism had come over from China to Korea, and this Confucian university, the children of nobles could study at this university for the purpose of taking exams to uh, get a position in the government, sort of like civil service exams. But the idea was if you wanted to have a position of authority in the government, you had to, be, you had to study and the tests were on Confucius law. Uh, you had to know Confucianism very well. It was much more about the philosophy of Confucius than it was about uh, any other sort of administrative tasks. But in the fourth century, Buddhism came into um, Korea and many temples were built. Later on in the 14th century, Neo-Confucianism had come across and it almost completely pushed Buddhism out. It became the official religion of, um, of Korea. In the late 8th century, this Shela kingdom began to fall apart and it began to split up into various groups. And one warlord named Wang Jian in 918 AD, he formed a new state which he called Goryeo. Goryeo is the from that name, we get Korea today. That's the, the, the predecessor to the name Korea. And then he became the ruler of all the peninsula, the Korean peninsula, in 935 AD. This was the period that was known as the unitary dynastic period. 918 is when he started taking it over. And then uh, this unitary dynastic period, under a single monarch over the whole peninsula, lasted up until 1910. This kingdom was powerful enough that they fought off invasions by the Chinese several times up until the Mongols and, uh, under um, the Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan was the grandson of, of Genghis Khan. He became the ruler of China. They called it the Huan Dynasty, but he, he created a dynasty in the same pattern as the previous Chinese dynasties, but the rulers were Mongols. They were the descendants of Genghis Khan and his people, so they were a rough bunch. They invaded a lot, they captured more territory, and so in 1231 they invaded Korea. And even though they rampaged up and down the peninsula of Korea for many years, they never could subdue the very tough um, Koreans. They, and, and this sort of, uh, this image here is a battle between the Koreans and the Mongols as they attacked. And eventually the Yuan Dynasty declined and then fell, and so Korea regained its independence. 
in um, 1392, there was a general, Yi Song Gi, who was ordered by uh, his king in Korea to attack the Ming Dynasty in China. Well, that was not a very good idea, and he knew it wasn't a very good idea, so instead he turned around and attacked his bosses, and he became the king of Korea, and created in, uh, in the 1392 the Joseon period of Korea. He moved the capital to Seoul. And so from 1394 on, the capital uh, was in Seoul, Korea, which is more the middle of the country. Um, Korea has an unusual claim in that in 1443, they invented their own alphabet. The, the, the king, the wise man during that period of time, invented the alphabet. They know exactly when it was. It's probably the only alphabet anywhere in the world that they can point to the exact time and the exact person who was responsible for developing their alphabet. Prior to that, they had used Chinese characters at the, as the Japanese had at one point, but they know when it started, and it was a very intentional kind of act, 1443. Um, 1592, which is re represented over here, you get the invasion of Korea from Japan. The Japanese invaded Korea twice in the 1590s. Both times they were winning on land, but they got defeated at sea by a Korean admiral named Yi Sun Sin. And he had this very cool weapon. I don't know if you know what a turtle boat is. When, if, you try, if you're out looking in stores and stuff, you will see these small models of ships that have like a shell on top with sharp spikes on it. This was something that this admiral, Korean admiral, invented so that they could not board his ship or they couldn't, you know, um, couldn't shoot arrows into it. And they were ter tremendously successful, a sort of enclosed shell, um, which is why they called it a turtle ship. When Japan lost these two attempts to invade, it's called the Imjin War, when they lost the Imjin War invading Korea, they went in shortly after that into a period of isolation. The isolation that I mentioned that was over 200 years long, where they got behind, and we'll talk about that, and then the Meiji Restoration that pulled them out of all of that. But in Korea, um, they, one of the things that happened was that the Japanese, when they finally retreated from Korea, because of uh, not being successful at sea, they took with them a great many very skilled artisans, particularly potters. Some of them were forced, some of them were convinced that because they had been friendly toward the Japanese, they would be treated badly when the Japanese left, but most of them were actually kidnapped and taken into Japan. Today, some of the most beautiful of the Japanese pottery you see with the sort of the, the uh, white, um, in fact, it was Japanese potters that invented uh, Chinese, the, Korean potters that had been in Japanese porcelain. They also created the white uh, glaze that you see on a lot of Japanese ceramics, including the crackle glaze and the celadon, the green glaze. Those were all Korean inventions. And it was Korean potters that had been taken into Japan. And the Japanese will even acknowledge that today, that that was a Japanese, uh, the Korean idea. So in the 18th century, Koreans traveling in China met Jesuit priests and they brought the Christian religion to um, Korea, even though it, there was persecutions of Christianity in 1801, 1839, and 1866. Korea, now South Korea, became highly Christianized, more so than any other East Asian country. Um, the Christian churches of South Korea today send missionaries all over the world. Um, some of the largest churches in the world are South Korean Christian churches. South Korean Christian churches send missionaries to the United States because they know we need them. Um, but they're very active. So Christianity is more present in South Korea than, any, than, than anywhere else. Although some people believe that the underground Christian church in China may be the largest church in the world. That there may be more Chinese Christians than all other Christians on the planet together. But they don't know that for sure. Then we get to the 19th century and Westerners, you will notice some of the Western faces here, here and down here, began to come into Korea after a period of isolation. The, all of the countries, China, uh, Korea, and Japan, all went through periods of isolation. But in the 19th century, Europeans started coming to Korea. So we have this photograph. But the main reason I put that photograph up is those are really cool hats. <laughs> I don't know where to get one of those, but I would love to wear one of those hats. Anyway, so the, they broke down the effort to be isolationist and in an effort to, coming back to the idea that Japan needed 
um, minerals, they needed oil, and they wanted to try to get it from Korea. In 1876, Japan forced Korea to open their borders to trade with, uh, with Japan. Immediately following that, in the 1880s, Korea signs trade agreements with the U.S., with Britain, Germany, Russia, and France, and so they are now open to all the world. Uh, King Gojong of Korea, at that point, had a slogan. He said, Eastern ethics with Western technology. But he had a really hard time getting the Koreans to accept that. They did not want to trade with or interact with the Westerners very much, and so there was a lot of difficulty with change. Particularly because, as I said, Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism is, is an ultra-conservative kind of Confucianism. One of the principles there is recognize your place in society, fulfill your obligations, and you know, be loyal to the people around you. That almost inherently, the way it was understood in Korea, prevented people from changing. Prevented them from changing the culture. And so the king was really swimming upstream trying to get people to change. But eventually, in the 1880s, um, Japan began to take more control from China over the affairs in Korea, because China had been kind of running things in Korea, even though they were independent. And conflict between Japan and China over Korea ended up breaking out into the first Sino-Japanese War that China and Japan fought in 1894 and 95. I mentioned before, and I'll talk about more detail, Japan won that war, and as a process, as a result, they took over complete control of Korea. Later on, because the Russians didn't want to let the Japanese take advantage of their victories in East Asia, the Japanese and the Russians had a war, and the Japanese won that war. And so Japan ended up controlling all of Korea and much of Manchuria in the northeast part of uh, China. Now, this is a period in 1910, we began what is called the colonial period of uh, Japan over Korea. At first, when in 19, um, the, before 1910, when the Korean Peninsula was controlled by Japan, the Japanese began to make some changes. They had a regent and a council running the country, and some of their early changes were great. They, they had slavery abolished in the Korean Peninsula. They, uh, re, they would not allow child brides anymore. Um, widowed women were allowed to remarry which had not been allowed previously. And so some of the things that Japan was doing in Korea sound like good ideas. But in fairly short order, um, Japan forced all of the newspapers in Korea to shut down. They abolished Confucian thought. They began to take land away from Korean farmers and give it to Japanese farmers to encourage the Japanese to come over. They would encourage Japanese businessmen to come to Korea. And if they came and set up their businesses in Korea, the Japanese would then shut down any Korean businesses that would have been competitors to them. They went so far as to replace the study of Korean culture in schools with the study of Japanese culture. And so, um, and eventually, in uh, 1908, they abolished the Korean army. Finally, after all of this sort of effort to wipe away the Korean culture and make it Japanese, the Japanese annexed Korea in 1910 completely and just said, you're now part of uh, Japan. And so this is what it ended up looking like starting in 1910 up until, uh, for the most part, the, the Second World War. All of this was considered under the control of Japan, uh, was annexed, and then much of Manchuria in China was controlled, and they renamed it Manchukuo. Um, so this 1910 to 1945 was the colonial period. Colonial meaning they were just a colony now of Japan. Um, Korea was forced to support Japan as it got more and more aggressive and started leading toward the Second World War. Korea had to provide food and labor for the Japanese. Um, in 1919, after nine years of being annexed as a colony, there were protests, peaceful protests across Korea and the Japanese responded by arresting and executing thousands, uh, even though there were peaceful protests uh, over, the, over what was being done to try to deny the Koreans their own culture. So uh, eventually, in 1938, a little bit down the road, Korea, the Korean language was outlawed. They were not allowed to speak Korean. Um, the Japanese attempted to force all Koreans to take Japanese names, and it, there was a requirement that they attend Shinto worship at Shinto shrines, which is the Japanese religion. So there was a clear effort to try to wipe out the Korean culture and history and language. 
Uh, in fact, sociologists have said that if the Japanese had not been defeated in the Second World War that, in 1945, it looked as though it were, it were likely that the Korean culture and history would have been completely washed away and there would have been nothing left of that. Fortunately, that did not happen. But among other things, uh, Japan treated Korea as a conquered people in forcing uh, Korean men to fight in their military and thousands of Korean women were uh, kidnapped and forced to become what were called comfort women for the Japanese military. They were prostitutes and they didn't have any choice about that. Um, quite a number of years ago, um, after years and years and years of the women, the few women that were left alive after all this, um, you know, they're quite old now, they had continually demanded that Japan apologize. Well, the ones that were still alive, Japan offered to pay them and they said, we don't want any money. We want an apology. And they never have received that apology even today. So uh, that continues to be a, a matter of some real concern. During this period of time, the per capita rice consumption in Korea dropped by 35%, uh, just over one third, because so much of the food was being exported to Japan or in support of the Japanese armies as they proceeded. I'll be right back, Captain. <laughs> He's the captain, he can interrupt whatever he wants. Okay. Um, so, getting a little bit more toward the details of the Korean War, um, Japan had defeated Russia in a war in 1904-1905. But despite the fact that Russia withdrew from uh, Korea and from Manchuria at that point, there continued to be some spats between the Japanese army in Manchuria across the border to uh, Russia at that point. And both of them had other priorities. You know, Russia became the Soviet Union, of course, in, in the, the early 1900s, 1917. And so when the Soviet Union was formed and they got into the Second World War, um, Stalin was concerned not with the Japanese. He didn't want to have to worry about whether the Japanese were going to create problems for him. He was worried about Germany after Germany invaded uh, Russia. He betrayed Stalin, Hitler betrayed Stalin and invaded Russia under Operation Barbarossa. And um, so all of Stalin's concern was about Germany and defeating Germany. And the Japanese didn't want to have to worry about the Russians across the border because they were concerned about fighting the United States Navy in the Pacific and fighting battles in China and to take over much of the rest of uh, East Asia. So they signed, Russia and Japan signed a neutrality pact in 1941 and said, we promise not to fight each other because we've all got other things to do. And so during that period of time, um, Stalin maintained that neutrality pact. And in fact, um, until the Germans were defeated at Stalingrad and began to be pushed back, at that point, Stalin turned and started thinking about the East as well because he was not happy just with his plan to take over part of Eastern Europe, which he ended up doing. He also wanted to take over much of East Asia the other side of the Soviet Union. And so he began to be concerned with that. And once the Germans were kind of on the run, he began to push some material and some troops into the east in preparation for what he thought was going to be the eventual battle with the Japanese. But um, for all of that, Stalin did not want to have a two-front war. He didn't want to be fighting in the east and in the west, even though he had ambitions in both. So he focused on the, the west, the Germans, and he actually wanted the Pacific War, the war between Japan and the United States and other allies, to continue because the longer that battle continued, the more he could stay out of it and concentrate on the, the fight against the Germans. So Stalin was actually providing secret intelligence from his relationship with FDR and Churchill to the Japanese because he wanted to extend the Pacific War until he had defeated the Germans and then he could focus on trying to take over more of East Asia. Make sense? So he was actually supporting them and they had a neutrality uh, pact, but then in April of uh, 45, he canceled that neutrality act. Said, we're, you know, it's over, we're not going to renew that. And the Japanese are scratching their head because by this time they know that things are not going well for them. The Japanese kept wanting the Russians to step in and negotiate for them with the other allies because they thought that Russia, with whom they've had a neutrality pact, might be able to get them a better 
better terms for the surrender uh, than they were able to get the unconditional surrender. So what happened was Stalin had promised in two of the major conferences he had with the other allies, with uh, Churchill and with FDR, both in 1943 and in 1945, in Tehran and Yalta, he promised that within one month of the defeat of Germany, he would declare war on Japan. He would enter the war on the side of the Allies against Japan. And so, um, but the Japanese didn't know that. The idea was that Stalin, again, was playing both sides. As, as evil as a person as he was, he was a master manipulator. He really knew how to play the political game. And so, within one month, almost to the hour of the surrender of Germany to the Allies, we have the invasion of the Russians into Manchuria and then into Korea, which was controlled at that point, up to that point, by the Japanese. This is called the Soviet-Japanese War of 1945. And when Stalin invaded, he took it very seriously. This chart gives you an idea. These are Soviet troops streaming across from the Soviet Union into Manchuria and then all the way down into Korea. Um, it, it was a, a massive attack on all fronts. And in this, the USSR quickly conquered Manchukuo, which was Manchuria, Inner Mongolia, the Southern Cyclone area, the Kuril Islands, Northern Korea, and moved south on three separate fronts. Now, during the conversations at Tehran and Yalta, the Allies had agreed that because Korea had been under the control of the Japanese, they probably would need someone to help them along for a while to get them back on their feet. So the agreement was amongst the Allies that USSR, who's in this region, would take over the northern part of Korea and the United States would take over the southern part of Korea just as custodians until they could get them ready on their own and they could have their own elections and then they, they'd be uh, on their, there was no intention of them controlling it for any period of time. But unfortunately, when this happened, when the Soviets invaded in 1940, um, well, that there were no U.S. troops to speak of in Korea at that point, very few. Um, so the Russians come in and they start down into Korea and it looked as though they were going to sweep through the whole peninsula and there were no U.S. troops there to stop them. And so very quickly the U.S. said, hey, Stalin, Joe, you remember that we agreed that we would share responsibility for Korea. So how about if you stop and say the 38th parallel? Much to their surprise, Stalin honored that. He came down as far as the 38th parallel and then he had his troops stop. So this is the 38th parallel. The Russians came in, we now call it North Korea and South Korea, we didn't have that division yet, but the Russians came in from uh, Soviet Union through China, North Korea, down to the 38th parallel, and then they stopped. Americans very quickly the following month, this was in August, they actually uh, declared war on, uh, Soviet Union declared war on Japan on the 8th of August and began their invasion. That was two days after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and the day before the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. So right in between there. <laughs> they invade, they come to the 38th parallel, and the next month was the quickest that American troops could be landed. They were landed, and American troops came up, not in force. The idea wasn't that they were getting ready to fight another war, but they were supposed to be able to take over custodial care of the Koreans until they got on their feet. Well, the Russians began to control North Korea pretty severely. There, were a, there was a large Communist Party in North Korea that had been involved in supporting China during their civil war, the, the uh, supporting Mao. And so these two forces are supposed to be working together, the US and USSR, to get Korea back on their feet. In the North, they did that by trying to find someone who could be their ruler, somebody they could put in power in the North that would do what they wanted. They picked two or three people that were well known as leaders, but the first time those people said, no, we're not going to do what you want, the next morning they'd be picked up to be taken to work and nobody would ever see them again. So finally the Russians landed on a fellow who had been a captain in the Soviet army, whose name was uh, Kim Il-sung. They made him the new guy that was in charge of the North. In the South, 
the U.S. kept trying to get the Russians in negotiations to agree to an election, to agree to move forward on uniting the country, and the Russians always found a problem. They always had some reason not to do it, particularly because in the South, surprisingly, there was a lot of unrest. In the North, the Russians were suppressing any, anybody who complained. In the South, because they're supposed, the Americans were supposed to be representing freedom, people who were complaining about another force being in their country, you know, the Japanese were controlling us, now that you Americans are trying to tell us what to do, and they're saying, we're just trying to help. But they had riots, they had, and the South Korean government, or the, the government that existed in South Korea at that time, were suppressing this, these violently, 10,000 people were killed on Jeju Island because they were, they were protesting even violently against being told what to do by even the United States. And so Russia kept saying, you guys are having all those problems down there, we're not ready to have an election, we don't have any problems in the north. The U.S. then turned it over to the U.N. and said, you solve this problem because the Russians won't listen to us. The U.N. proposed a date of election. Russia refused. So eventually, the North had an election, and they elected the chosen guy by the Russians, uh, Kim Il-sung, as being the new president of the North. In the South, they had an election, and they ended up putting uh, Syngman Rhee in charge down there. So now you've got two governments in Korea, there is a separation on 38th parallel. There is a communist North Korea and a democratically elected South Korea, and they break at the 38th parallel. Well, the North was not happy that they weren't controlling everything. Russia wasn't happy that communism had not spread to the whole of the peninsula. By 1949, um, Kim Il-sung, the new president who was under the control of the Soviets, he wanted to invade the South. He wanted to conquer the South. Every indication from cross-border skirmishes that they had had was that the Northern Army, North Korean Army, was much more powerful than the South Korean Army. And the U.S. had left South Korea, just like the Russians had left North Korea. And so Stalin, though, said it was too early. 1949 was too early to invade the South. And he would not allow Kim Il-sung to do that. But by April of 1950, three things had changed. One, in 1949, <coughs> The communists had won the civil war in China, and Mao was now ruling China. In August of 1949, he announced the People's Republic of China. So there now was another communist power in place in East Asia. Secondly, in 1949, the Russians had finally uh, tested, successfully tested their own nuclear weapon. Prior to that, Stalin was not anxious to pursue a conflict that would involve the United States because the U.S. had nukes and the Russians didn't. And the third thing was, in 1949, there were still U.S. troops on, uh, in the peninsula. And then they had left by 1950. So all of those factors meant that by 1950, Stalin gave permission to Kim Il-sung to invade South Korea. And the Russians actually put the plan together. They put together the plan for invasion for the, um, the North Korean army. And this is the way it all unfolded. On June 25th of 1950, much to the surprise of the South, the North Korean military invaded all the way across the frontier of the 38th parallel. They crushed the South Korean uh, military. Um, there was nowhere that the South Koreans were able to maintain their lines. The North Korean forces pushed the South Koreans all the way down into this little corner, if you can see it, which is where the city of Pusan was. Busan is now called Busan. That's where we're going to be tomorrow. This little tiny corner was all that was left of the South Korean controlled area. Everything else had been taken over by the North Korean communists. And at that point, the UN claims, uh, steps in and says this is an unjustified aggression. The UN called on all member nations to send troops and materiel to, to defend South Korea, to drive the North out. 16 nations sent troops and supplies so that it was a UN force, but Harry Truman was still president of the United States and he had said that he considered it an obligation to try to limit the expansion of communism. And so Truman committed uh, troops to, South, to this war, the Korean War, or the conflict, as it was called, or police action. Harry Truman did not get permission from the Congress to declare war. The United States never declared war, and since it was technically a UN action, 
It's been referred to as a police action or the Korean conflict, which many veterans of the Korean War don't appreciate the fact it's not even, it's often called the Forgotten War because it wasn't even technically a war. Although, you know, 54,000 Americans died there. So the um, Americans landed troops in Japan, the seat, so Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers was Douglas MacArthur. I'm going to talk about him in a minute, but MacArthur come, is called by Truman to go over into Korea and to step into this. And what he does on September 15th, um, he landed an amphibious force in Incheon, which is very close to Seoul. It's the port of Seoul, basically. And a large force landed there of American troops they ended up cutting the North Korean army in two. 125,000 were trapped in the south and ended up surrendering. The others were driven back north. In very short order, in fact, within uh, two months, the North Korean army was driven all the way back up to their border, the Yalu River, which is the border between China and Korea. And in November, uh, MacArthur, who never met a reporter he didn't like, announced through the media in the United States that our troops will be home by Christmas. Mm. And that all sounded good, and everybody was very thrilled about that. But unfortunately, as they were pushing up to the Yalu River up here in the north, the Chinese had promised to come to the assistance of North Korea if they needed it. <coughs> Stalin had said to Kim Il-sung, uh, Kim Sung il that if you need help, you have to get Mao to help you. I'm not going to, we're not going to commit troops there. Because again, he did not want to start something that would look like a war um, with the United States. So, when the North Koreans got pushed all the way back to the Yellow River, the Chinese, in repayment for support that North Korea had given them prior to this, during their civil war, 180,000 Chinese troops streamed across the Yellow River and pushed the um, United Nations forces back down not only uh, through North Korea, but all the way back down into the middle of South Korea. The city of Seoul ended up be changing hands four times in this battle. So the South Koreans get pushed all the way to the south. They have an amphibious landing in Incheon. They push the North Koreans all the way up to the northern part of North Korea, the Yalu River. The Chinese come into it and drive them all the way back down to the middle of South Korea again. And then a major counteroffensive by the south in uh, 1951 they're able to push back up and they end up pretty much right where they started at the 38th parallel. So this was the Korean War. This is how it all sort of uh, lined out so that by February of 1951, within just seven months of when the whole thing started, they're pretty much right back where they started. Now, the person that was responsible on the U.S. side for the Incheon landing and for leadership of the Korean conflict, as he had been for much of the, well, he's the army um, commander for the United States during the Pacific War as well. The naval commander was Chester Nimitz. But MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, is one of the most decorated soldiers ever in the history of the United States. He received the Medal of Honor. He was nominated a second time. He received two Distinguished Service Crosses. He received seven Silver Stars and the Distinguished Flying Cross with Wings. He's one of only five men that have ever been made general of the armies, which, which means a five-star general. Um, you've got one-star general is a brigadier general, then major general, lieutenant general, general is a four-star general, general of the armies is a five-star. He's one of only five of those. Um, he was commander of all the U.S. Army forces in the Far East. He was defeated, his forces were defeated in the Philippines, and he went to Australia, but then he led the efforts to come back up and retake the Philippines. Um, he was the senior commander of the Allied Powers, in, or supreme commander of the Allied Powers in Japan, and commander of all the UN forces in Korea. Now, unfortunately for him, the day before the Chinese invaded across the Yellow River, he had flown over the front, and that's why he got the Distinguished Flying Cross with the Wings, was for that flight, which was considered dangerous because, you know, the enemy was there. Well, his evaluation was the enemy is not prepared to counter uh, attack. There's no indication that they're gathering forces. We don't need to do anything. We're fine where we are. Well, the next day, 180,000 Chinese <laughs> crossed the Yalu River, and uh, his prestige suffered quite a bit from that. And as I've said before, I, I have great admiration for some of what MacArthur did, 
there are other ways in which uh, I think that there were some pretty serious problems with how, with how he approached it. But because of the fact that there was this back and forth that was happening in, in Korea, Truman did not want to have an escalation of the war. Um, the, once they finally settled back and forth and back and forth and they were at the 38th parallel again, MacArthur wanted another offensive north. He wanted to drop nuclear weapons. He wanted to drop another bomb. And Truman was a concern at that point that this would lead to a major conflict that would be not only the U.S. against China, but that Russia would come into it as well, and that we were on the brink of another world war. And so he said, do not escalate this thing, you know, kind of stable right where we are. And, and uh, MacArthur completely disagreed, and he publicly disagreed. He publicly was critical of President Truman. Truman asked him to come back to Washington, D.C., and he refused. He said, I'll meet you at Wake Island, but you have to come that far. Um, unheard of, because you know the president's the commander in chief. He's over everybody, even five-star generals. Eventually, um, it became known that MacArthur had, through private communications with some allied embassies, particularly Portugal and Spain, he had promised these embassies he would see to it that China was forced to enter the war so that we could defeat China as well, in direct contradiction of instructions from Truman. So, with the support of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on April 10th, uh, Truman relieved MacArthur of duty and replaced him with Matthew Ridgway, another general. Um, MacArthur was a huge, had a huge fans in the Congress and in the American people, um, and he thought that he would come back and he would be made president, that he would be the next president of the United States. And he made it known, and he had people supporting him in that, but he was not nominated. And so he never did have a political career after that. But he was the one, again, he wanted to turn this into a nuclear uh, war so that he thought, we'll get rid of the Chinese communists, we'll deal with the Soviet Union all at once. But that was contrary to his boss's instructions. Finally, the Soviet Union, in June of 1951, the USSR proposed peace talks. And peace talks began in June of 1951, at first at Kaesong and then at Panmunjong. And the, the peace talks were on again, off again, for, for three years. Uh, the best part, well, two and a half years. Because, primarily because the North Korean soldiers that had been taken captive by the South did not want to go back to North Korea. And the North Koreans were saying, unless you return all of our prisoners to us, then we won't talk about this anymore. And the South was saying, they don't want to come. What are, we, what are we supposed to do with that? And so that, you know, the North Koreans would walk away and then they'd get back together. And so finally, in November of 1952, Dwight Eisenhower was elected president of the United States. And Eisenhower said as part of his campaign that if I'm elected, I will go over there myself and I will see to it that this war comes to an end in Korea. He was elected before he actually took office. He did go to Korea and he hinted pretty clearly hinted, but hinted, that there might be a nuclear option from the United States if they did not find a way to uh, a peace treaty. So on 27th of July of 1953, there was an armistice signed. An armistice is a, a, an agreement to stop active conflict, but it was not a peace treaty. Technically, the Korean War has never ended. North Korea and South Korea are still in a state of war, and they have been since 1950, um, and it's never been resolved. Interestingly, yesterday, um, the, you know, the president of uh, North Korea met with the president of South Korea at the joint strategic area in the demilitarized zone, and um, Kim Jong-un is now saying we now begin, uh, we are past the history, the generations of conflict, we have come to a new period in history of peace. He is saying that he is prepared to, to get rid of nuclear weapons if in return for economic development, because North Korea has been in serious economic problems for the last 30 years or so, and I'll mention that. But in the Korean War, 54,000 Americans died, 3 million Koreans died, and 1 million Chinese died. In North Korea, um, during the conflict, the North Koreans had a purge where they, they killed, they executed anyone who was educated, a political leader, a religious leader, um, any military leaders that they had any questions about, 
A hundred thousand people were killed in a purge so that no one that had the potential for rebelling against um, Kim Sung il at that point, uh, Kim Il-sung, then so 100,000 people died in order for him not to have any competitors. They also kidnapped tens of thousands of people from South Korea when they had invaded and took them back as forced laborers and, and for um, other purposes, basically slave labor. The end result of the conflict up until now has been the creation of the demilitarized zone, or the DMZ as it's called. It is a line which roughly follows the 38th parallel that is um, 160 miles or 250 kilometers long. It's two and a half miles wide or four kilometers wide. And it's an area of chain link and barbed wire fence, raked sand, mines, uh, trip wires, interlocking machine guns, mortar and artillery, observation towers all the way along, quick reaction forces prepared to respond at any moment. Now, interestingly, we were there just a month and a half ago or so, something like that, a month ago, uh, to the demilitarized zone. When was it? A month ago? A few weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this, these tunnels, first tunnel, second tunnel, third tunnel, fourth tunnel, are tunnels that were discovered that the North Koreans were digging under the demilitarized zone in an effort to have routes for um, invasion. And these have all been discovered by the South. We actually visited tunnel number three, and you can go down into it. It's 73 meters below the ground because they were blasting through solid rock and they had it so deep because they didn't, didn't want it to be heard. Well, they found four tunnels. They believe there are probably 20 more um, that are, are being dug by the North, have been. Maybe that's part of what the, you know, they'll stop doing now. But this area, there's actually, uh, there used to be active factories in the middle, which were benefiting North Korea and South Korea, and they were, so they were allowed to run. Not too long ago, those were stopped. They're no longer in production and uh, so not providing jobs. There are, there's a village that's in the DMZ. Um, and so it's a weird kind of place where part of it is, com is no man's land and part of it, there's life going on in a, in a strange kind of way. One, also nature has taken over. There are a lot of wild animals and wild plants that have grown up there that they, that to everybody's surprise, that don't even uh, exist anywhere else anymore. You know, that have been sort of gone extinct elsewhere. So it's a fascinating place. This is the joint strategic area, which is where uh, President Moon and President Kim just met yesterday and for the first time each of them stepped across to the other side you know the the Kim from the north stepped across to South Korea they shook hands uh, Moon President Moon stepped across to the North Korean side and shook hands and apparently all of the rhetoric is that they really are committed to making peace this time which would be quite extraordinary um, this is the fourth tallest flagpole in the world. It is uh, 160 meters tall in North Korea at Kijon Dong, near Panmunjom, where the peace talks were held. Um, and the North Koreans simply want to make sure that we know they're still there. Um, <laughs> when we were there visiting the DMZ, they were blasting music and various other things from loudspeakers from the south into the north. And um, they also do weather reports. The North doesn't have any means by which they can determine weather forecasts. Uh, and so the South broadcasts weather forecasts on the speakers just, just sort of show what they're capable of. And some, our guide told us that um, some people have said, well, how do you know they even listen to this? And they said, because when we do the weather report and we say it's going to rain, they take in their laundry. <laughs> so we know that they actually are paying attention. Since 19, um, since the end of the, the war, South Korea has grown and developed phenomenally. Early administrations in South Korea were not particularly democratic. Uh, Syngman Rhee um, used a 1949 security law to close newspapers, imprison critics, and by 1960, the corruption in the South was very, very bad under his administration. In fact, in 1960, there were student riots in the South that forced Syngman Rhee to resign. The South Koreans have never been reluctant to express their opinions about things. Remember I told you even the Mongols couldn't suppress the, the Koreans during the time they were in control. There have been several military coups that have happened, um, but despite all of that, despite the fact that their governments have, until fairly recently, not been very democratic, they still have grown economically, and they are considered an economic miracle. From the 1960s to the 1990s, they transformed from a poor, agrarian culture to being a major economic power. 
South Korea, you'll see this in Busan tomorrow in terms of automobiles, major manufacturing. They are a quite wealthy uh, country now. The highest development of roads and bridges, ex education, they really have done phenomenally well. They still have had some political problems. Prior to the present president, President Moon, um, there was a woman president for the first time uh, whose name was uh, Park Gwyn Hai, and she was the daughter of one of the previous uh, dictators that had taken over to military cool. Her father was a general. Well, she was found guilty of uh, arrested, found guilty of corruption, and is now in prison. But they uh, they currently have a uh, new president, and South Korea has done phenomenally well. In addition to North Korea, we then have South Korea. What? The <laughs> Kim Il Sung. <laughs> the guy, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. What did I say? Yeah. You said South that Korea. Old. That's North Korea. North Korea. Sorry. Yes. North Korea. I do know the difference. Yeah, yeah. North, North Korea, uh, Kim Il-sung developed immediately after being put in power by the Russians a cult of personality. He had statues and portraits everywhere. Um, in 1994, he died and his son Kim Jong-il took over. And then in 2011, his grandson Kim Jong-un. So this has become a hereditary uh, dictatorship. There, it is an extremely repressive regime, which we're hoping is beginning to change. Um, the people's lives are strictly controlled. Religion is outlawed. It is the world's last Stalinist regime, following Stalinist communism. And so, um, in the very worst sense of any of that, despite receiving a lot of help from the USSR after, you know, after the uh, Russians left, the North and even after the Korean War, the economy in the North stagnated in the 1970s. It had gotten worse and worse. There were severe famines through the 1990s, floods, droughts, typhoons, with the government in North Korea seemingly being unable to do anything to address the needs that were produced by those. Malnutrition is very common, especially among children. In fact, the Chinese. Um, a number of North Korean children uh, who were in China, the Chinese did a study of children between 1998 and 2003 and determined children of the same age in North Korea were five inches shorter on average than children in South Korea because of malnutrition. Um, and they, that's had a huge effect. Um, the people suffer terrible hardship, brutal uh, oppression. Because they started out fairly even. North Korea now has 25 million people. South Korea has 50 million people. Um, and there is no comparison in terms of the economic wealth of the countries. Questions about any of that? Yes? What's that? Yes, yeah, they, they're the same ethnic people, they speak the same language, there's no, there's no difference other than the political systems and the demilitarized zone. Yes? Well, the only thing, I don't know what's happened today. Yesterday, I know, they shook hands. They talked about, yeah. What was the end result? Well, the last thing I heard was that uh, Kim wrote that this is the start of a new history, that after generations of, of peace, that he left a message to that extent. Beyond that, I don't know where they're going with it. I, I don't think there's been any details released about, you know, the specifics of the conversation. Yes. Have to be loud. Say that again, I'm sorry. So did Kim Sung-un, is it perhaps that he's changing his approach because of fear about the unpredictability in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> it's probably likely that um, both sides have a fear of the unpredictability unpredictability of the leaders on the other side. Um, and so I'm pleased that President Moon and President Kim are dealing with this, and probably we need to, the U.S. needs to stay out of it for a while and let them work on it. Uh, it's possible, but who knows what would happen. So, yes? What about the slave labor camps of the North as? Do you know anything right. about that or any information? Well, the North Koreans uh, do have uh, forced labor camps or slave labor camps, some people would call them. And anyone who falls afoul of the government 
can be, rather than going to prison, they go to a labor camp. Um, and it can be for anything, including saying something wrong about the government. I mean, it doesn't take much. And many of the South Koreans that were kidnapped at the end of the Korean War when they retreated back north, they were sent to forced labor camps as well. Thank you all very much for coming. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about the history of uh, Japan.